Good morning and welcome to the Gospel Loft. We're in a little short series called Where Do We Go From Here? And today we want to do part two. I got a subtitle under the heading introduction called The Second Death of the Church. Um, soon after the second century, a downhill path for the church began. In the fourth century, the masses of Christians are or were becoming part of a state-run organization that had began with um, Constantine. Some historian believed that this would be a positive development in the church, as the terrible ten years of persecution under Diocletian had come to an end. This is nevertheless questionable in regard to spiritual life and to sound Christian doctrine because the result that we see is a little different to what is good for the church. Now most of the heathen practices were just Christianized. Children were reborn through baptism. Nimrod's mother-child image all found new ground in Mary and baby Jesus. The pantheon of gods were replaced with canonized saints, each one being a specialized intercessor. Now, sins could be worked off in purgatory uh, or alternatively, alternatively uh, bought back with um, indulgences. Then the Lord's Supper was perverted with the mass and transubstantiation. The Bishop of Rome was addressed, like we said before, as Holy Father and declared infallible. Mary, Mother of Jesus, became co-saviour with the Lord Jesus Christ, reigning as the Queen of Heaven, conceived immaculately, immaculately and declared sinless, even gone up to Heaven like Jesus himself. It's very similar to Zerus or Isis or Diana, the heathen goddesses who were the queens of heaven. The simple gospel was totally perverted and the church was ruled by Antichrist and died a slow but certain death. But this wasn't the second death. This was the first death. But then came the Reformation. The Bible was translated into the common man's language. At first there were small groups like the Waldenses, the Albigenses, and the Huguenots who opposed Rome's heresies. And then later came Luther and Zwingli and Calvin and Huss and Tyndale and many other reformers that followed. Now the result was of course the thunders of Rome and thousands upon ten thousands were killed at the stakes for believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and His salvation by grace alone. The Reformation brought a measure of restoration to the Church. It repented of the dead works of Rome, but stopped short of any real progress, any further progress. And then came John Wesley and took it a step further and, and, and he was preaching that you need to have faith towards God. After that, the Anabaptists came along and they said, well, you have to repent of your sins and then according to scripture, you need to be baptized. Yes, after conversion. And then appeared the Pentecostals, early 1900s. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues came back and the gifts of the Spirit and also a measure of holiness. Much was restored to the church but at the same time each of the reformed groups persecuted the ones who wanted to take it a step further. The last lot that came onto the stage were a shift took place, was 
a hyper faith movement and out of this grew a prosperity and fleshly gospel and a new downturn began in the church and a second death came out of it once more the world was married to the church and it looked as a, a place was created for the grandchildren of God in other words, a place where the unsaved children of the saved parents could experience the world with daddy's approval. Well, I, I, I want to refer to the stage of Hillsong. Sound doctrine was soon lost after the first part of the Reformation and something called futurism was coming into the church. Very few people know about this whole concept. And we will deal with it in another day when we deal with the 70 weeks of Daniel. It is something that was invented by the Jesuits and promoted so that the finger that was pointing at Rome and saying thou art the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of petition, uh, to take that finger away the Jesuits came up with a master plan. That still prevails until today and today multitudes are going back to Rome and, and and want to be on the good footing with them even people like Billy Graham they were making pilgrimages to see the Pope and soon they have forgotten Rome's travesties and murders the Catholic bandwagon to their so-called heaven has been enlarged and extended now lately to the Buddhists, uh, to Islam and all the heretics like Benny Hinn and, and so forth. People are leaving the churches to, jo to join these groups and these shows. But what is the answer? How, how do we mend this terrible problem? The first point I would like to make is sound preaching. A watered down gospel does not give us a good foundation in our relationship with Christ. It is our anchor. We need to get back to sound expository preaching and teaching. Nothing against topical sermons. They are fine for evangelism to get people drawn to Christ and excited about the gospel. To point out sin. To get to know scripture. And to prepare a church, we need to get to know the Bible. And we get to know the Bible, what it is all about. And use it as the only reference of truth. We need preachers who prepare themselves in the Lord and who are baptized with the Holy Spirit. Who are versed in doctrine and truth and living a clean and godly life and not making excuses for sin, just to keep up the numbers in their church. As preachers we can put together words and sentences and paragraphs and, and even chapters. It is needful that we work our sermons well, but without the Holy Spirit's anointing on speaker and on hearer, it all remains a dead letter. For this to happen, we need to seek the face of the Lord in prayer, which builds a bridge between doctrine and spiritual growth. And here we come to the next title in this. The second part is spiritual growth that we need. Once we have received Christ as our Savior and been born again, we need to go on spiritually. After baptism, we need to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. If we fail to lead people spiritually closer to the Lord, the people will die spiritually again and slide back into a dead fleshly comfort zone. And the church meeting just becomes another event. We need to exercise the spiritual gifts according to 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 and above all teach the people about it in an orderly way and fashion. 
The prayer meeting is the place to start it. Then there is the worship part during the church services, which needs to be conducted without smoke and excessive drumbeat and work the people up into a frenzy. It is not necessary. We need to lead the people into the presence of God. To achieve true spiritual growth, that's a team effort led by mature elders. That's what we need, a mature eldership in the church who will take the lead in active participation. Those are the men that will lead the younger to follow. The ministry has to be shared and not dictated. Everyone making his calling and his election sure before the Lord. It is well formulated in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26 and I've read it so many times. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Yes, let's unpack this verse for a moment. And we start with has a psalm. Paul starts with the easiest of all participations, to read a psalm in the assembly. Every participation needs to be accompanied with unction. The Holy Spirit reveals the text and gives the man the nudge to get up and to speak. We know this stirring in our heart because we are born again. Every meeting has a theme, has a purpose to edification. And the reading of a simple verse can have a tremendous impact on the preacher and his preaching, especially if it confirms the preacher's doctrine that he's about to go and give to the congregation. We nevertheless have to overcome natural, psychological and spiritual hindrances. My voice is not good enough, they say, to speak in public. I'm too feeble. What if I offend somebody if I say something out of order or out of place. And my favorite one is, what if it is not of God? Those are things we have to overcome. Common excuses to keep silent, that's what they are. We need to make decisions against all odds and let the Spirit of God arise. To reading a psalm has been given a general permission. In most evangelical churches, this is a normal participating in the service. But it needs to be spontaneous and not choreographed or, or dictated by some professional. We, we, we leave this to the dead churches around us. This activity has to be encouraged by the church leadership in its entirety. Then the second point is has a tongue. How is it has a tongue, that somebody has a tongue? Here it becomes already problematic for many of the evangelicals and even more of the Calvinists are against it because they are cessationists. They believe that the gifts of the Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit have ceased with the death of the original apostles and we're only there to initially give a kickstart to the church. I firmly believe that these gifts are for the whole dispensation between Pentecost and the second coming of Christ. We don't see every week these mighty miracles of healing and miracles of all kinds of things. It's not the point. Yes, but we read a scripture. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1, it says, Follow after love and desire spiritual gifts. I have underlined desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. I like the word desire. Without a desire, nothing will happen that will further our relationship with God and our service to the fellowship of the saints. We have to desire salvation even and then accept it as a gift of God. And so it is with spiritual growth and spiritual gifts. The Lord will not force anyone into progress. 
out of this refusal we have created a bunch of hyper doctrine preachers who will debate their views for three hours and never convince the opposition and that's simply because although they speak of the Holy Spirit they never demonstrate his power any of the gifts or even displaying any fruit they flog a dead letter but let us get back to tongues tongues have three purposes first to build up 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 4 he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifies himself we would put forward a simple question do we need edification every Christian is in desperate need of it and if speaking in tongues can help it please seek it with all your heart because you need to be edified I doubt if only the early church had this need oh they had their need yes but so do we even more and then secondly to encourage interpretation 1 Corinthians 14 verse 13 wherefore let him that speaks in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret if we read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 14 we soon discover that Paul was concerned with a problem of excess speaking in tongues could become futile if it takes up time when people rattle on forever without a interpretation coming forth yes speaking in tongue um, demands interpretation if it is of any use therefore let the man that speaks in tongues look for interpretation the speaking in tongues can help the uncertain person to render a word in his heart he uses the tongue as a springboard to overcome a hesitant spirit because he could just prophesy but maybe there's something that's holding him back but thirdly to be a sign unto the unbeliever I like this one 1 Corinthians 14 verse 22 wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe but to them that believe not when I first heard tongues in the 1970s in a Pentecostal church in Cape Town I thought God spoke from the rafters to me it was a sign indeed as I was a total unbeliever I was just searching for something it took me to the core yes when, when the church service was finished we ran out of the meeting and I lit two cigarettes at the same time I was so confused but I'm not the only one with this kind of experience I heard it often Paul says that he speaks in tongues more than any other and also says that we ought not to forbid speaking in tongues many preachers say that the Word of God is for all generations and so do I say it it doesn't change because Jesus doesn't change nor the word does doesn't change but as soon as um, it does not match their own experience they will reduce the meaning to symbol or to time or to culture or to history this they do not just with the gifts but they do it on all levels I call it select, uh, selective uh, doctrine when something doesn't fit my thought well we just disregard it then has a revelation is the next point this can refer to a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom for instance we are needy people and how wonderful is it when someone who does not know our circumstances just gets up reveals the problem and then gives a comforting word by the Spirit of God the Holy Spirit is a revealer of truth a revealer of sin and a revealer of Christ here we need to take utmost care that we do not reveal problems that we are already knowing and think we are helping God along every revelation agrees with the word of Scripture and brings nothing new to the table that God has not revealed in our Bibles before let us therefore 
be extra cautious when being used in these gifts. And that has an interpretation, is the next point. It is not just a tongue that can be interpreted. It can be a dream, a vision, even a word of prophecy. Sometimes things have to be brought into context. The congregation has to be well informed and, and taught in being used in the gifts of the Spirit. Therefore Paul says, let all things be done unto edifying. And then I've put here, at last, has a doctrine. I believe that all things we have spoken about above have some spiritual impact on the preached Word of God. When we come to the pulpit and the ministering body has confirmed the Word by the Holy Spirit, preaching becomes anointed and easy. If the integrate part of prophecy, of revelation, of tongues and interpretation and of inspired scripture reading does not go before the preached sermon, doctrine becomes like flogging a dead horse and the preacher becomes a pitiful creature on a soapbox. But before all this comes the praise and the worship. And here I would like to say a few words in conclusion. Prayer, praise and worship and I want to read from Psalm 100, verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I don't have to jump around and roll on the floor, and, but I can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Then verse 2, come before his presence with singing. Singing is a wonderful way of worshipping God. Then verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Somehow we have to enter in. We have to open the doors. And thanksgiving is a wonderful, wonderful method of getting it. It unhinges the doors. It opens them up. Praise in the courts of God. Oh, brings joy to all those that are in heaven. Ephesians 5, 19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That is the atmosphere in your soul when you come into the meeting. Every meeting before the Lord should have this kind of format. Joy is born out of a testimony. God is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generation. That's also in Psalm 100. These are all words that encourage. And before we even enter the premises on Sunday morning, our heart should be prepared and our soul should be charged with the Holy Spirit. The notes and words of amazing grace, how sweet the sound, should permeate the room instead of idle chit-chat. When singing begins, it leads us into the courts of God's temple. Prayers of thanksgiving have opened the door and then we are led into worship in the most holy place of God and ministering the word in the gifts of the Spirit can begin. This is the format of scripture as seen in Psalm 100 and Ephesians chapter 5. We don't make a rigid formula, formula out of it, but we use it as a guideline. And then the next step. Um, I read again one verse out of 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 1. Follow after love, we said, and desire spiritual gifts, but this time I have underlined, but rather that ye prophesy. Yes, we know what it all means really, but we never do it. We now want to concentrate on the second half of the verse. What is this prophesying all about? We, we need to make a distinction between the gift of prophecy according to 1 Corinthians 12, 14 and the office of a prophet according to Ephesians 4, 11. We will get clarity on the latter later in our study. But now I want to read Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. That was um, John who wanted to fall on his knees and worship an angel. 
And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. And then I've underlined, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In this verse, we can unpack a few things regarding the gift of prophecy and its purpose. John wants to worship the angel who has revealed so much to him in this revelation. The angel then forbids it and points out that he is a servant as much as John and as much as those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It becomes clear that whatsoever we do, it is as servants and that our worship is directed towards God. And then we come to the center of the message in this verse, the spirit of prophecy. Oh yes, it is concentrated around the testimony of Jesus. The contents of the gift of prophecy is always centered around God and gives us the idea that we uplift the Lord and at the same time, we edify the believers. Well, the well or the fountain from where we draw the words for the prophetic utterance is the word of God, the Logos. We create a word of encouragement in a rhema word. And we form it that way and we speak it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We do not foretell great future events through this gift. It's not expected from us. We read that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in other tongues and they prophesied, uplifting the name of the Lord. And I want to give us two scriptures here. One from Acts 19 and verse 6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. They prophesied. And then in Acts chapter 10 and verse 46 it says, And they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. The process is a progressive development as faith arises and gives us confidence to utter words of prophecy. The reading of a psalm can be the starting point. And we find that out of this exercise, the Holy Spirit lets us speak words of encouragement or even revelation at times. And here is an example of this beginning with the reading of Psalm 103. And I want you to imagine the man that gets up. You see, worship has just ended in a way. And this man gets up and he reads a psalm. Bless the Lord, all my soul, he says. He's full of the Holy Ghost. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness. And now he's, he's full of it. And he sees there is more to come. Something boils in his heart and begins to prophesy. And he says, Hear these words, my brothers and sisters, and take to thyself the word of the Lord. For I am the Lord that healeth thee, and saves thy soul from destruction. Harden not thine heart this time, and know that my grace is sufficient to forgive you all you have sinned against me. Lift up thine eyes and see that the Lord is good and kind and long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, saith the Lord. And then he, he shakes a bit and he sits down. There is deathly silence. So somebody puts a song out there. Maybe hallelujah. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And the congregation feels, feels with it. And when the song has ended, a tongue, an interpretation, and God is glorified and the congregation edified. Amen. Until next time, when we carry on under the same theme again. God bless you.